So for today's presenter, I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Kristen Maish. And Kristen has a PhD in clinical psychology from the Ryerson University. She's received clinical training from a number of different health services, including St. Michael's Hospital, the Psychology Clinic, St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton, the Women's Health Concern Service. She's completed her pre-doctoral residency training at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, working as a clinician in the Mood and Anxiety Ambulatory Service and the Complex Care and Recovery Service. She was also a study therapist for clinical research trials of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia at Ryerson University through her graduate career and has extensive training in the area of insomnia and other sleep concerns. So I'm very pleased to have Dr. Mace with us today and I will pass it over to her for the rest of our... Hey, thank you, Vinita, and thank you to Wellspring for having me back, uh, albeit virtually. Um, it's, I'm looking forward to speaking with you all about sleep today and taking a few questions after as well. Um, so the first thing that I always want to go over when I'm talking about sleep is um, the need for sleep management in the first place. Um, so this graph is basically showing the difference between insomnia symptoms in cancer patients on the left uh, and in the general population on the right. Um, so as you can see, there are significantly uh, more difficulties with insomnia or sleep difficulties in general in people who are going through cancer treatment or who have already been through a cancer treatment. Um, as you can see on the bar graph on the left, uh, in individuals with cancer, this study has shown that um, those experiencing symptoms of insomnia in general uh, are up to 80% of the population. Um, that shows that yellow bar there up to the 80%. And then the blue bar, the blue portion of the bar is representing uh, approximately 30% of individuals are meeting diagnostic criteria for insomnia disorder in individuals with cancer. That compares with a substantially fewer number of people in the general population, so people without cancer, who report experiencing symptoms of insomnia, which is at approximately the 30% range, again, represented by the yellow portion of the bar on the right-hand graph, um, and the blue portion being approximately 20% of the general population meeting criteria, diagnostic criteria for insomnia disorder. Um, Interestingly, and as may be reflective of some of your experiences, these symptoms of insomnia or sleep difficulties more broadly often do not resolve following cancer treatment or even after the remission of cancer. Um, so there is certainly a need to address these insomnia issues in this population, which I suspect is why some of you are here today. Uh, and hopefully I can give you some information that you will find helpful for resolving some of those issues. Uh, so in terms of recommendations from a cancer perspective, the Canadian Association for Psychosocial Oncology or CAPO recommends in general that we assess for and treat sleep problems broadly in cancer populations. And the frontline recommended treatment for chronic insomnia, so long-term insomnia, is CBT, cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, now, some of you may have heard of cognitive behavior therapy for other disorders. It was originally developed for managing um, symptoms of depression and psychosis. It's a little bit different when it comes to sleep, and I'm gonna go over some of those recommendations today. Um, CBT is quite well suited for people who are, are struggling with cancer symptoms or who are post-cancer treatment uh, because there are no interactions. Obviously, it's a cognitive and behavioral intervention rather than a medicinal intervention. So there are no uh, med medicinal interaction issues. Um, and CBT can also be quite helpful for managing additional symptoms that um, go along with sleep difficulties, but also go along with cancer treatment in general, such as fatigue um, or anxiety. The research suggests that CBT is at least as effective as sleep medications, but um, in general, we consider it to be safer, more sustainable. And the, in the long term, the outcomes tend to be more sustainable um, in that a lot of people find if they take uh, medications for a long period of time, once they discontinue the medication, the sleep problem returns. Whereas with CBT, because the strategies are behavioral and uh, related to your thinking, it, what we're trying to do is develop new habits and new um, ways of interacting with your sleep that once learned can uh, subsist in the longer term. 
Uh, in terms of CAPA recommendations for sleep medications, uh, they do recommend that CBT be used before uh, sleep medication. That being said, that they suggest that sleeping pills or sleep meds should be used uh, as appropriate. So as, as your doctor thinks is relevant or, or um, recommended on a short term or intermittent basis. So um, for an acute experience of insomnia, such as a week or a couple of weeks or intermittently, uh, you may often have seen people get sleep prescriptions for things like short term travel uh, in order to manage jet lag and, and that type of thing. Also importantly, uh, they recommend that sleeping pills should be used with monitoring from your doctor to make sure that there are none of those polypharmacal, pharmacological issues um, or interactions. And finally, they suggest that the dose should be the lowest possible effective dose in order to minimize feelings of drowsiness and or confusion the next day, which some people report when they take sleep meds. So kind of circling back around to my area of expertise, which is cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. It's empirically based treatment, which just means that there's been a ton of research on um, what is maintaining insomnia in the longer term. And that is those factors are, are uh, what CBTI is based on. So we look at targeting those factors specifically in order to improve the insomnia symptoms. Um, the other piece of the empirical research or the uh, evidence-based um, portion of the treatment is that the strategies were tested repeatedly. So in multiple studies with multiple populations to make sure that the pieces we're recommending actually do work um, and specifically have an impact on um, the insomnia um, difficulty. So in terms of evidence for CBT in individuals with cancer, uh, we have again two columns here and I'm just referring to my notes here, but on the left, as you can see, we have quite a lot of research um, that has accumulated to support the effectiveness of CBTI in post-cancer treatment populations. So once people have gone through a, a treatment for cancer and the treatment has complete, there's a ton of research suggesting that CBTI can be quite effective for lingering uh, insomnia symptoms. We have a bit less research for CBTI in individuals who are in the midst of a cancer treatment, uh, which sort of makes sense given that well, during treatment, there are a number of other side effects that are often co-occurring um, with the cancer treatments, which would make it a little bit difficult to untangle whether the CBT is, being eff is, is effective or whether it's another medication or exactly where the symptoms are coming from. Um, so all of that is to say is there is evidence supporting that CBTI can be quite effective for people who have been through or are currently in cancer treatment. So let's get to what actually, what, what is insomnia exactly and what causes it in the first place. So we know that there from research from quite a long time ago, as you can see, this is from Spielman in 1987, uh, who proposed that there are three different areas of factors that maintain insomnia or that cause insomnia. So predisposing factors, those are basically biological or genetic factors that maybe uh, predispose you to a likelihood of developing insomnia or insomnia symptoms at some point in your lifetime. So predisposing factors, um, might be something like if both of your parents tend to have have or have had experiences with chronic insomnia that might put you at a slightly higher likelihood of developing those symptoms yourself at some point in your lifetime um, precipitating factors this is basically we think of these as generally life stressors that can cause us uh, to have disrupted sleep in the short term um, so this can be things like job loss um, uh, divorce or separation or breakup. These could be things like a glo global pandemic causing some added stress. Um, and even, even positive, like theoretically positive things can cause us a lot of stress, such as moving homes or getting married or getting a new job with a lot more responsibility. All of these factors that are uh, can precipitate disrupted sleep in times of high stress. And theoretically, when this stressor has resolved, so once you know you get on your feet in that new job, or once you find a new job after losing one, theoretically the insomnia symptoms should resolve. However, this is where the perpetuating factors can come in, which is that um, once we have had an experience with insomnia or a experience with poor sleep, often we tend to engage in behaviors to try to improve that sleep or capture that lost sleep. And some of those behaviors can actually be maladaptive in the long run. Um, they can actually perpetuate or maintain insomnia in the long run. And it's those perpetuating factors that we really target in CBT for insomnia to get you sleeping better um, in the short and longer term. We're going to talk about those today. 
Um, so uh, this is typically where I get a little bit of aud audience uh, interaction or a attendee interaction, but, it, but I will just go through this from a didactic standpoint. We can talk about it um, later on in the question period. But for yourselves, you might want to think about whether you maybe have experience with some of these perpetuating factors. So is there an increased time in, in bed, spent in bed compared to pre-cancer and pre-cancer treatment? Is there more time spent napping? Withdrawing from typical activities. So that might be going to the gym. That might be going to work for eight, 10 hours a day. Uh, whatever it is you do in your day-to-day -day activities, is there a slight uh, downward turn in terms of how much of that you're doing? Um, my guesses would be yes. Is there any irregularity in your schedule? So is your rise time, your bedtime, your meal times, are those disrupted at all? Are there medications that you're taking that you might not normally be taking that have an impact on fatigue, drowsiness, sleep, anxiety, any of that stuff all could impact? Um, and have you developed or do you have already any beliefs about sleep and fatigue that maybe tend to um, create a bit of anxiety around sleep? generally speaking, as well as cancer more specifically. And a really important factor here is the concept of sleep effort. So a, a strong effort for sleep can actually cause or perpetuate insomnia in the long run, which seems a little bit um, counterintuitive, uh, but it is important to note that the harder we try for sleep, the more we're kind of lying there in bed, white knuckling it, waiting for sleep to come actually the further away sleep can get. And we'll talk about why that is uh, in a bit, but often we find that the harder people are trying to fix that sleep problem, the more difficult their sleep becomes. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a few different things here, but one of the most important things for getting a deep sleep or getting access to those kind of deepest stages of sleep where we um, are having slow wave sleep where our brains are consolidating learning and memories and very importantly, that's when healing is occurring, um, physical and emotional and mental, all of that good stuff. But in order to get that deep sleep, we need to have a strong drive for sleep. Um, and sleep drive is the pressure to sleep at any given moment. Um, I like to think of sleep drive as a sleep bank account where we're earning sleep dollars over the course of our day in order to purchase a high quality sleep at night. So I'll reference that analogy in a moment. But basically, we want this strong drive for sleep in order to access high quality sleep. Uh, so presumably when you wake up in the morning and for this happy little fellow, he's waking up at 7 a.m., Presumably when you wake up in the morning after completed sleep, sleep drive should be fairly low. And then over the course of the day, drive for sleep should increase. Uh, meaning that by the time we get to bedtime for this guy, it's uh, around 11 p.m., we should be very sleepy. And that level of high sleep drive, that, that very full bank account of, of sleep dollars should purchase a high quality sleep. This is the first perpetuating factor, which is if we don't have that high, uh, high drive for sleep. So we need to build that sleep drive over the course of the day in order to have a continuous and high quality sleep. So behaviors that can negatively impact sleep drive are spending too much time in bed compared to how much time you're actually sleeping. Um, so if you're a six hour sleeper spending 10 hours in bed, there's four hours of wakefulness right there. And importantly, you're not gonna be building, having, <clears throat> excuse me, having the opportunity to build as much sleep drive the next day. Other factors that can have a negative impact on your ability to accumulate sleep drive over the course of the day would include napping, uh, sleeping in or lingering in bed in the morning, and going to bed too early. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why that is, but basically, if we're thinking about this as a, as a bank account, all of those things are taking away from that that bank account, whether it's taking away from the opportunity to earn sleep dollars or whether it's spending money on sleep that's outside of the main sleep period, such as napping or sleeping in. Importantly, decreased activity can also have a negative impact on sleep drive. And of course, people who are struggling with cancer or cancer treatment often have to engage in a lot of rest. So this is another place where insomnia can start to take place. <clears throat> so I'll talk about sleeping in first. So let's take our same little happy guy. And typically he's waking up at seven. However, maybe it's a weekend or maybe he's more fatigued than usual. And he's decided he's going to sleep into whatever time this is, 10, 10 a.m., 10.30, let's call it. 
So he's getting a bit out of bed later. Um, importantly, he might have woken up at seven, but even if he's lingering in bed, trying to get a little more sleep or reading a book or listening to the radio, until his feet hit the floor, he is not earning sleep drive. He is not earning those dollars for his bank account. So let's say he gets out of bed around 10. He does not have as much opportunity to get to that high sleep drive level by bedtime. There's just not as much time to earn those sleep dollars. So he does not have that uh, high quality sleep at night as a result because the sleep drive is not high enough. Similarly, napping, perhaps he gets up at seven, but you know, around 3 p.m. when a lot of us have that mid-afternoon slump, decides, well, I'm working from home anyway, I'll have a little nap, um, even if it's short, half an hour or an hour. If he has that nap, he's spending some of those sleep dollars on that, on that nap time, such that by the time he gets to bedtime, 11 p.m., he no longer has accumulated an adequate amount of sleep drive in order to purchase a high quality sleep. The analogy I always like to give for this is, you know, getting home from work, you're really hungry, um, or getting home from your day out and you're really hungry and you have a really um, delicious but unhealthy snack, uh, such that by the time you get to dinner time, you're not actually hungry for your full course dinner. And the difference there being that that slice of pizza or whatever it was may have tasted really good, but it's not as nutritious as the full course meal you had planned for yourself. So although this person maybe uh, is able to fall asleep or maybe even is able to stay asleep, the quality of their sleep over the course of the night is going to be much poorer because they don't have as much money in that bank account to purchase a high quality sleep. They've spent it um, on the on the nap instead of the full, uh, the full quality sleep sleep period at nighttime, um, but this is also where we see difficulty falling asleep or disrupted sleep over the course of the night if there's an inadequate amount of sleep drive for to purchase that full quality sleep um, or full quality night of sleep. So this brings us to the second perpetuating factor, which is related to our circadian rhythm or circadian clock. So we all have a circadian clock, an internal circadian clock. Um, our master clock is in our brain, but we have many little clocks all throughout our body. It's and our circadian system is responsible for a number of different activities um, from temperature to release of hormones. And of course, the sleep is what we often talk about here. Um, Although, our, although the clock that we use on the wall or societal clock is exactly 24 hours, our internal clock often drifts a little bit longer than 24 hours precisely. So we actually have to do things every single day to set that clock to make it match with our society's clock. Um, so as such, behaviors that can have a negative impact on our circadian clock and therefore our sleep, which is governed by that circadian clock, include having a highly variable time, uh, timing of getting going to bed and getting out of bed. Interestingly, I actually care a lot less about uh, variable bedtime. The most important part anchor here is the getting out of bed. So again, if we think back to our happy face guy, if you're waking up at 7 a.m. one day and 11 a.m. the next day, there's a four hour variability and that's gonna result in some disruption to that circadian system. Another important factor here is not having enough exposure to natural light. So the sunlight that, that we see every morning or less so in the winter is uh, one of the most important, it's called a zeitgeber or a cue for setting our circadian system. It's how our brains know what time of day it is and what we should be doing. Our bodies like predictability. Importantly, not rigidity, but predictability is very helpful for our sleep system staying on track. This brings me to jet lag. Um, probably many of you have heard of jet lag, if not experienced it. And one common thing people talk about is you know, heightened irritability, fatigue, disrupted sleep, because your body is a bit confused. It doesn't know what time it is or what, when it's supposed to be going to sleep or waking up. Um, so let's say, you know, I flew to Spain this weekend, which obviously we can't do in, in the lockdown. Um, but if, if I was able to do that last year, six hours ahead. So right now I might be about ready for lunch, but in Spain, I should be actually getting ready for dinner. And that's maybe not a big problem because in, in terms of my digestive system, I'm still getting ready for a meal, but it's going to be a problem later in the evening when I am exhausted and I'm, uh, or I am not exhausted, but the rest of Spain is going to bed. So for me, it would be, you know, 6 PM, but in Spain, it would be midnight. And although I want to get on Spain's clock, I'm completely mismatched with their clock. The interesting thing about jet lag is it ha has nothing to do with travel per se. It's about that mismatch between 
our internal circadian clock and the clock on the wall. And so that's how jet lag can actually develop at home as well. If we have a mismatch between our internal clock and what we're supposed to be doing. So for example, if I'm waking up at 7 a.m. on weekdays and then 11 a.m. on the weekend, that's a four hour difference. And that is kind of equivalent to flying to somewhere with a four hour time difference. I think it's a bit further than Vancouver, um, but somewhere with a four hour difference every weekend, um, which just means that we have to reset our clock every Monday morning. Uh, it's a very brief overview, but the essential thing there is that we need to keep as much, um, as little variability, particularly in our rise time as possible in order to mitigate against the risk of having kind of a jet lag syndrome that develops over time. I'm gonna move on to factor number three, uh, which is an overactive arousal system. So if we, if we have an overactive arousal system, this can actually override our natural sleep system. Um, and it's important to have this arousal system. So certainly if, uh, you know, if we're out camping and you hear a rustling in the woods and it sounds like a bear, you don't want to be snoozing through that. You want to be figuring your, your body wants to react to that. However, if it becomes overactive, then we're no longer reacting to an immediate threat or danger in the environment. We might be reacting to a concern that we forgot to add something to the grocery list or something like that. And that can really cause a disruption to our sleep if that arousal or anxiety level has become overactivated. Um, so this kind of uh, can bring me to something called conditioned arousal. So uh, I'm not going to go over this in extreme detail given the given the time, but because we could talk about this for uh, we could talk about conditioning for a while. But the way in which it pertains to sleep is something that we like to call the switch. Um, and the switch that I think of is, is when, you know, maybe you're sitting on the couch watching a TV program and you're feeling exhausted, you're yawning, your eyes are drifting closed, head is nodding. Uh, you're ready to sleep. You're maybe even starting to doze on the couch. And then perhaps you get up to your bedtime routine, go to the bedroom. And as soon as you turn that light switch off, or as soon as your head hits the pillow, bang, you're wide awake again. And that's what I call the switch because your body was prepared for sleep beforehand. And then suddenly the arousal system has uh, kind of activated and is now disrupting your ability to sleep. So the bed, bedtime routine plus lots of wakefulness, sleeplessness, tossing and turning, feeling upset, feeling frustrated, all those things that go hand in hand with insomnia. When you pair those two things, night after night after night after night, the response, uh, this is when arousal, the arousal response can become conditioned. Um, and so this, this means that we end up having this bedroom where everything, or bedroom environment, where everything but sleep has become associated with the bed and bedroom environment. Uh, so my cat's map of the bed here, the cat typically is not only sleeping in the bed, they have a grooming salon, a yoga and stretching studio, um, a foot attack zone, et cetera. And similarly for us, if our bed has a, I'm gonna read my work emails um, here in the morning, I'm gonna read my paper here in the morning, I'm gonna watch TV at nighttime, I'm scrolling through the news on my phone, all of those things are conditioning our brains to associate the bed with a place of wakefulness, whether that's uh, stress related to work uh, or interest related to social media or interest related to reading or TV. Those are all wakeful activities that are happening in the bedroom. So we actually want to get rid of anything wakeful that's happening in the bedroom environment. And we'll talk about that in a moment. In terms of chronic insomnia, I'm just going to summarize these. The causal factors can be related to the circadian system, which uh, can determine that optimal timing of sleep. And we can have some problems arise if there's a lot of variability in our schedule, in particular in our rise time. Um, the, the sleep drive or the drive for deep sleep, um, that sleep dollars analogy that I mentioned before, that sleep drive system has to accumulate over a 24 hour period. So we can have a problem if we don't have an adequate opportunity to build up a very high sleep drive. And finally, our arousal system can override our system, our sleep system during emergencies. Um, and that's important, we need that, but it can become a problem if it becomes overactive. And this can occur for a multitude of reasons, conditioned arousal, as I mentioned, a lot of pain, um, maybe in, in medications that are causing wakeful, wakefulness in the bedroom, uh, illness-related concerns or anxieties, preoccupation with sleep that's causing us to become very worried about sleep. Um, so that's where the, some problems can arise.
Now getting to the point that I think you're probably all here for is the what helps. So that switch problem I mentioned, if that sounds familiar to you, you can feel really sleepy leading up to bedtime. And then as soon as you get into the bedroom or as soon as your head hits the pillow, you're wide awake again. If that sounds familiar to you, you might have this conditioned arousal issue. It occurs without awareness. It's certainly not something that people are intending to develop. Um, but the solution for this really is if the bed and, the, and wakefulness have been paired, we need to unpair them or break that association by being in bed only when we're asleep or as much, uh, as, much as possible. And the way that we can do this is uh, through stimulus control. So the rules for stimulus control, which is just a fancy way of saying avoiding being in bed when we're not sleepy, is to do just that. So to get out of bed when sleep is just not coming. So going to bed only when proper sleepiness is there. And I would highlight or distinguish between sleepiness and fatigue here because proper sleepiness is what I mentioned before. Those people you see on airplanes or on the subway who eyes are kind of rolling back in their head, maybe they're experiencing the head nod. That's proper sleepiness. And that's different than a feeling of fatigue or a feeling of mental exhaustion that many of us can feel when we're bored or stressed or um, just quite busy in our day. So going to bed only when sleepiness has, is high is an important part of this. Getting out of bed when you're unable to sleep. Now, some people will say, okay, so that means if sleep doesn't come immediately, I should pop up and pop back down. No, um, I don't want you jumping in and out of bed all the time, but I would encourage you to notice if there's a moment when you um, can tell sleep is just not coming back right now, that would be a time to get out of bed and go do a relaxing, um, engaging activity until sleepiness returns. Um, if you need kind of a time estimate, uh, estimate window for that, it would be around 20 to 30 minutes of, of sleep not coming despite you being in bed and feeling tired or sleepy, then I would encourage you to get up, go do a wakeful activity in a different room to break that association. And when sleepiness returns, come back to bed. Getting out of bed at a consistent time, regular time each morning is helpful for the conditioned arousal piece or the stimulus control piece, but also for that jet lag piece, the, the uh, circadian system piece that I mentioned before. So picking a, a rise time, a feet on the floor time and setting an alarm each morning to keep that consistency can be very, very helpful. Making sure that you're using the bed in the bedroom environment only for sleep with the only exception to that being sex, um, but taking all those other wakeful activities out of the bed and bedroom environment. Um, a lot of people like to read before bed or even watch TV, TV before bed and I encourage you just to move those activities into a different room um, for the time being. And this is not a life sentence. This is something to, to try in order to reset your sleep system to uh, address this insomnia issue or sleep difficulty issue you might be having. And finally, avoiding uh, or resisting the urge to take naps during the daytime is very important for stimulus control. Uh, there are also benefits to externally pr produce sleep deprivation. So although it doesn't feel like it, if you are deprived of sleep, that means that you're going to have an incredibly high quality sleep when your body does get the chance to have a, a proper full sleep. Um, and that super deep sleep, that very high quality sleep, um, allows us access to slow wave sleep, which again, I'm not gonna go into in detail, but the chemicals and hormones and everything accessed during that time is very good for our brain and it can have a positive impact on pain and um, how we're feeling during the day in general. Okay, so what if there are physical limitations to following these rules? So mobility issues are certainly something that can get in the way of this. Um, and for certain folks, there are issues related to falling. So getting up in the middle of the night, if you're not sleeping, is not always as easy as it uh, sounds, although most of you might say it doesn't sound that easy. Um, so one way of doing this, instead of getting all the way up out of bed and going to a different room, you can consider engaging in something called counter control, which is basically just sitting up in bed, taking a different position, or if possible, moving to the other side of the bed. Um, if mobility is, is, is adequate, then I'd encourage people to actually get up out of bed, go around to the other side of the bed, maybe turn the night light on there, night, or a light on on that side of the bed, um, engage in your reading or whatever restful activity before getting back out of bed and returning to the other side, which is more the sleep side. So again, we're trying to break that link between the sleep area and the wakeful area. So that's a way of doing it um, if, there is if there are mobility considerations. 
And then another piece of this is attempting to give up on the effort to sleep, which is again, easier said than done, but trying to relax those white knuckles that we sometimes have about trying to get the best sleep possible can actually allow our natural sleep sleep system to get in there um, and do what it's meant to do, which is uh, get the sleep that our bodies need. Okay, so sleep efficiency uh, is highly correlated with sleep quality. Um, and that's been shown in many, many studies. This, the idea of sleep efficiency is basically, a, or the definition of sleep efficiency is basically that it's a proportion of the time spent to sleep compared to the time spent in bed. So we want a, a sleep efficiency between 80 and 90%, which means you actually shouldn't be sleeping for 100% of the time that you're in bed, but somewhere between 80 and 90%. That's the range for for good or normal sleepers. Below 80 or below 80% is suggestive of insomnia. So in order to get that at sleep efficiency in the proper range, there's a few things we can do. Um, so if there's a difficulty with that drive for sleep, so your sleep bank account is a little bit low, then we can strengthen it by limiting your time in bed to how much time you're spent to sleep um, by doing the following. So you can monitor your sleep for two weeks. We recommend two weeks because that's the empirically validated period of time to get a snapshot of sleep. Um, the reason for that is that sleep fluctuates on a nightly basis. So to get a sense of what your average sleep looks like, two weeks is recommended. Um, and then calculate your average total sleep time during that two week period. Oh, and the asterisk is you can download free sleep diaries at that website, uh, drcolinkearney.com. And then what you wanna do is limit your time in bed to this amount, your total sleep time, plus 30 minutes for natural normative wakefulness. So if you're a six hour sleeper, you might be choose, select your time in bed to be six and a half hours. So restricting your time in bed is part one. Um, so keeping, making sure that you are not in bed longer than six and a half hours, for example, every single night, feet on the floor by a set time each morning, that's part one. Equally important is putting time back into your time in bed window if you are if sleep has started to recover. So when sleep becomes normal and you're noticing day, a lot of daytime sleepiness, so again, you know, head nodding, eyes rolling back, your sleep efficiency has gone up over 90%, which is too high. That's suggestive of sleep deprivation. And finally, if your sleep onset is very, very quick, so under 10 minutes, that's unusually quick. Um, so if all of those things are happening, or even a couple of those things are happening, you might wanna experiment with adding some time back into your time in bed schedule. And we recommend doing this by adding 15 minutes per week until sleep actually begins to suffer again. So you start to notice a little bit more insomnia happening. Um, a lot of people I work with, instead of being finicky about the 15 minutes, we'll just do half an hour for every two, every two weeks until the sleep starts to suffer again. This can be difficult for some people. So an alternative to sleep compression, so compressing to a strict time in bed window based on your total sleep time. An alternative to that is to restrict your time in bed gradually. So for example, by 15 minutes per week or 30 minutes every couple of weeks from a set starting point. So let's say you're spending um, 10 hours in bed right now, but you're asleep for only six of those. If being in bed for only six and a half hours feels just too severe right now, or it doesn't seem feasible, then you could start by restricting your time in bed to nine hours and then gradually move to nine and a half and then go to nine after that and so slowly sort of compress your time in bed window until sleep starts to improve. Now I equate this to ripping a Band-Aid quickly, which would be the restriction one that we talked about before or ripping the Band-Aid a little bit more slowly. Um, the quickest way to do this is the one from the previous slide, but this can also be effective if the, if the sleep restriction or sleep compression um, is not doable right now. So I kind of went over this verbally, but an example of, of doing this gradually would be to, um, to move your sleep from, compress your sleep gradually from uh, seven, eight hours to 7.5 for week one, seven hours for week two, and then stop when the sleep efficiency reaches that 80 to 90% range or until some of those sleepiness factors that I mentioned in the previous slide start to occur. Okay, so to briefly summarize this, um, this is what we send people home with often in an insomnia treatment, which is that you're picking a time that you're going to wake up and get out of bed. So get those feet on the floor at a specific time every day. Um, we suggest going to bed when you're sleepy, but have an earliest bedtime. So uh, you're not allowed to go to bed until 
let's say midnight or 1130. Um, and again, you're basing these, these times on uh, that time in bed window that we talked about before. Um, actually, it's more adherent to if you're not sleepy at, at bedtime to stay up later, even if that's past the bedtime that you note on this slide, that's actually better for your sleep in the long term than trying to get into bed before sleepiness is there because what's going to happen, sleep's not going to come, and that can perpetuate the insomnia problem. Uh, we suggest getting up out of bed when you can't sleep, whether that's because you're worrying or whether that's because insomnia is there. We suggest getting out of bed, going to a different room when you can't sleep. Use the bed only for sleeping. Avoid all other wakeful activities in, in bed in the bedroom and avoid daytime napping. So I do want to talk about sleep hygiene briefly. Um, you've probably heard of, or you may have heard of sleep hygiene, which I'll go over in a moment. Uh, but it is important to know that healthy sleep practices are necessary. So sleep hygiene is necessary, but rarely sufficient for actually treating an insomnia problem by themselves. Um, if you are doing all of these things, that's great, but it's more the insomnia uh, CBT strategies that are going to help an insomnia problem, whereas these sleep hygiene things are just important in general for everybody as it pertains to sleep. Uh, so these might, may look familiar to you, but um, caffeine, if you're having a ton of caffeine or um, high strength caffeine late in the day, that could disrupt um, your ability to fall asleep at night. That's simply because caffeine has a long half-life, which means it can linger in our system for quite a long time. Uh, nicotine can similarly, it's a stimulant and can keep us awake for longer. Exercise is important, of course, um, but actually high intensity exercise late at night or close to the bedtime period for some people can cause greater arousal. Uh, so the timing of exercise can be important. Um, if you notice hunger is waking you up in the night, having a high protein snack before bed can help alleviate those issues. Um, but trying to avoid getting up in the night to eating uh, to eat is, is also important. A lot of people will say that alcohol or cannabis or other substances help them feel drowsy or help them drift off to sleep, but they have a negative impact on our sleep quality um, and may result in more wakefulness during the night or at least a deteriorated quality of sleep. And then it's important to have the bedroom as, as quiet, dark, and cool as possible. If our sleep environment's too hot, that can actually cause our bodies to wake up because um, our internal body temperature cools off while we sleep. And then I do wanna go over arousal before we wrap up today because that's a big piece of this as well, um, that or at least that a lot of people report. So if you are noticing a lot of arousal at bedtime, so that could be that switch happening before bed, that could also be just an experience of worry or anxiety about sleep or in the bedroom. Um, so some guidelines for that would be to create a buffer zone in the evening, uh, potentially consider engaging in a relaxation practice to bring your baseline arousal uh, down. Um, and then again, also to get out of bed when you're not sleeping, to unpair the bed and bedroom with that aroused, anxious, wakeful experience. So the first one, creating a buffer zone. What I mean by buffer zone is just having a transition from goal-oriented, productive daytime activities to a more quiet and peaceful, relaxed time. So we suggest a, an hour wind down period in the evening that can be watching TV, reading, whatever. Um, but it should certainly the whole uh, evening should not be one big wind down. So. Um, I've had clients and I always reference Mr. Rogers who would get home from his day out and the sun would be shining, it'd be like 4 p.m. and he'd immediately change into his um, kind of sleepy sweater, uh, the, the cardigan. Um, and that it's similar to other clients I've worked with who maybe get home from work at 5.30, 6 p.m. and they immediately get into their pajamas and slippers and everything is about trying to be as relaxed as possible. Doing that's actually overdoing it and that's more of a sleep effort issue. So the, the wind down period should be an hour, maybe a couple hours, but not excessively more than that. And it should not include super productive activities like laundry or work related emails, et cetera. Um, those who have a very hard time staying awake uh, late at night might want to have a shorter buffer zone. So if you're very, very sleepy and you notice you're drifting off when you're watching TV um, or older adults who sometimes have a little bit of trouble staying awake late at night, you might want to have a shorter uh, buffer zone just so that you're not accidentally dozing or accidentally napping during your buffer zone period. If you have a very noisy mind, so that overactive arousal system, Leaving the room when your mind is active can be very helpful. Um, 
uh, thoughts tend to be more lucid and reasonable in a different room. Uh, the number of people I've worked with who are worrying excessively about their grocery list or about uh, whether they remembered to, you know, set out their lunch for their child tend to notice that while that felt, you know, 80% anxiety in the bed while they're trying to sleep, when they get up and go to the kitchen to check if that lunch is there, check if there's milk in the fridge, they notice actually that worry goes way, way down. So by getting out of bed, you're kind of hitting a couple of birds with one stone in the sense that the worry sometimes can go down um, when we're not in that sleep state where those sleep chemicals are swirling around and making us not as quite as rational as we typically are when we're awake. Uh, relaxation strategies that people find helpful. I'm, I'm not going to go over these in detail, but you can certainly, there's a lot of this stuff on the internet that uh, you can Google. There's some apps, um, smartphone apps that have a lot of these things. Progressive muscle relaxation is tensing and releasing your muscles. Diaphragmatic breathing is breathing very deep into your, down into your belly in a systematic way. And a couple of other relaxation exercises listed here. Importantly with these exercises, the intent for this would be to target your baseline arousal system. So I'd recommend doing this, you know, at the latest before or after dinner, but not right before bedtime. The goal of these exercises is not to produce sleep, but rather to target your arousal system overall. Um, and we can talk about why that is if anyone has questions on that. But again, I'd recommend doing this during the daytime and not with the goal of producing sleep. Um, there are some other things that can contribute to feelings of fatigue. So, you know, sleep often takes the, it gets a bad rap for making us feel fatigued, but it's not always the fault of our sleep or sleep system um, that we're feeling fatigued. So here's a whole bunch, inactivity, overactivity, your diet, um, maybe you're dehydrated, haven't had enough water, a glass of water actually for a lot of people um, can perk them up a little bit infections, hypothyroidism, that post-lunch circadian dip that I mentioned before, a um, bunch of other sort of mental health type symptoms. Big one's boredom as well and eye strain. So all of a, a lot of people are working from home, staring at the computer. Um, I know I ask people sometimes, well, what were you doing when you felt so fatigued? And they, people will say, oh, I've been at my computer staring at the same data file for four hours. Well, of course you're fatigued. It's probably a bit boring. So some things you can do for that is stand up and stretch, go for a little walk. And a lot of people will notice that uh, when they use fatigue as a cue to activate, um, their energy actually improves. Related to cancer, fatigue can certainly be related to treatment uh, components of radiation and chemotherapy, surgery, weight loss, um, biochemical or endocrine changes. Regardless, to manage fatigue, it is important to make sure that your, your nutrition is adequate, your hydration is adequate, and you're getting enough movement and light in your day. So I think I mentioned sunlight at the beginning of the presentation. With some of those more medical causes, whether it's uh, you know anemia or uh, difficulties with iron or B12 or that type of thing, or whether it's cancer related, there are some ways of medically managing fatigue, those types of fatigue um, symptoms. It's important to also focus on what you can do to manage fatigue in a moment to moment um, basis. We can't do this experiment since we're not in person, but the experiment I often will do with people is, you know, we've been chatting or I've been chatting at you for 45 minutes. And um, typically that's when people who are listening to me would be sitting listening for 45 minutes. It's maybe getting a little boring. It's maybe getting a little slow. And what I would suggest that we all do is stand up from our chairs, stretch, move around, um, maybe even walk around a little bit. And almost everyone will say that their fatigue rating before and after that exercise improves. Paced activity. So if resting is necessary, you can rest in a, in a um, paced manner. So that just means resting, uh, having intermittent periods of resting and activity um, can help with overall feelings of fatigue during the day. I will probably go over this a little bit more later because I could talk about this for a while. Um, but it's important to think about the impact that canceling activities can have on fatigue and sleep. Um, so while a lot of us when we're fatigued don't feel like doing anything, often people will say, even if I didn't feel like going for that walk or I didn't feel like calling that friend, my mood and actually my fatigue as well have improved a lot, even 
um, if I did, despite not feeling like doing that. So that, that could be social related, that could be exercise related, that could be other activity related. Um, using fatigue as a cue to activate is, is probably the best way of, of improving energy and fatigue during the day. Um, so again, if you are going to engage in pace rest or other types of rest, scheduling rest in a place other than the bed can be quite helpful. So uh, even if that rest is happening on the couch or maybe on a yoga mat and there's a, a set time involved, maybe 20 or 30 minutes, um, attempting not to actually fall asleep, that can be helpful too. Um, and then we're not also getting that pairing between uh, rest and, and wakefulness in the bedroom. So again, to summarize, there's a number of causes of fatigue uh, that low sleep drive can contribute. Um, having kind of that jet lag without the scenery, as we call it, or the, the jet lag without travel, um, that jet lag syndrome with a highly variable schedule can also contribute to a, a great deal of fatigue. Hyperarousal, including that condition arousal, can make us feel exhausted because, of course, that's that feeling of kind of going around with a lot of tension or anxiety or arousal during the day. And inactivity can actually increase fatigue and create um, deconditioning, which is kind of a, a, again, a long way of just saying that you're um, deconditioning the sleep from the bedroom environment if fatigue is happening everywhere and rest and napping is happening everywhere. Okay, so I went through that quite quickly. I, I saw a few questions come in. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that this is uh, Benito and I can turn it over to you to go through the questions. Yes, absolutely. So first off, I just want to say thank you so much um, for that super informative presentation. I'm sure um, people found that information, um, the graphics that you presented to be very helpful in their understanding of how they can approach any difficulties that they might have with sleeping. 